Developing Yourself and Others by Nine Dots Development, introducing Jane Shaw to talk about unconscious bias. So I'll just get straight into it. What do you think is the significance of an unconscious bias? Well, as we know, the subject is very um, widely discussed these days and researched as well. And uh, the reason that's, I think, becoming more to the fore of these discussions is because of the impact that it has in how people are working with each other and how productive they feel, how engaged they feel, how connected they feel, and the dynamics of those relationships uh, within work and how we treat each other are really fundamental to, to how well we perform, I guess. And how do you think that this relates to training? Well, I think it's really interesting because, again, the reason I say it's it's at the forefront is because there's an awful lot of unconscious bias training around and has been for some years now. Um, and, and, and as I said as well, it's been researched quite a lot recently about the effectiveness of unconscious bias training. And I think we probably go back maybe tw nearly 20 years when we saw people starting to talk about diversity and inclusion in the workplace. And unconscious bias training came out of that. And uh, there was a danger, I think, that it became a, a checklist activity. So people were doing unconscious bias training, um, but they didn't actually change biased behaviours necessarily. So what we saw, and there was a study uh, that was reported on behalf of Business Review uh, last October, um, where they talked about this idea that, well, you know, people are doing this standalone unconscious bias training, saying, oh, we've done that under our diversity and inclusion, but actually um, we were seeing a decrease in the number of uh, perhaps black men and women advancing within an organisation. That was a study from 2006. So what good unconscious bias training is, is not just the classroom tick box exercise, everyone sat through it, but actually ensuring that it raises awareness for people of what bias is, but it also helps them think about how they change their behaviours. And that has to be their behaviour, sorry, that has to be a conscious effort um, because they also need to be able to track progress of that conscious effort as well. So there's got to be some measurable element to it. It's not just a one-off training event. And do you think prejudice habits can relate to this? Yeah, oh yeah, and I think it's, it's, it's a really interesting phrase, this idea of us having these prejudice habits. So nobody, or very few people, I think, are consciously trying to um, be biased in some way, be prejudiced in some way. But it's so ingrained in perhaps the way we've been brought up, the influences that we've had that have shaped us, uh, that we need help unpicking them. So um, the organisation needs to provide uh, a broader context for that to happen in. So we want a longer term strategy that also has some sort of structural changes to it so that everywhere where bias could occur, there's a sort of a check, uh, whether that be when you're recruiting, uh, when you're holding performance reviews, when you're trying to incentivize improvements in diversity themselves, they should have a positive impact so what we're looking for is people having a sense of feeling included this inclusivity part of diversity and inclusion is really what we're talking about here and that to me is as you said that idea of breaking our own prejudice habits and we actually need other people to help us so i can be i might notice yours uh, and you might notice mine so one of the really key things about this is setting up the relationships at work that allow us to go it's not just that we've been on a course, but we continue talking about it and I can call it out and you can call it out and that we have that trust and that openness to say, none of us want this to be present. We don't want anyone else to be disadvantaged or prejudiced uh, against in some way. So getting into good, proactive, positive communication habits is really key. And you mentioned tracking progress. Do you think that there's like a linear way of tracking somebody's progress in terms of um, unconscious bias or do you think it's more of an internal thing? Um, I think an organisation needs to be clear about what measurable, observable behaviours would they expect to see and also outcomes. So, you know, we've mentioned recruitment, um, you know, so good organisations will be doing things like, you know, blind recruitments, et cetera, et cetera. So there'll be things like we can't see the candidate's name or, you know, as we know, research done quite some years ago around 
disadvantage you know same cv change the name from a very british sounding one to an african sounding one and they're getting less of job uh, um, invitations to interview so i think there's something about appreciating that the organization has a responsibility that goes beyond just a just a training course which i think is is what we're saying as well and and that diversity and inclusion policy which pretty much everybody has now shouldn't just be an hr document it should be living breathing so that certainly when i think about strategies that's part of it and do you think by gaining knowledge or consciousness um, it'll personally help an individual's work ethic grow even in their own personal development as well yeah i i'm not sure i can make a direct link to necessarily work ethic but certainly i would like to think that uh it creates a more inclusive workforce um and as you know i have a few feelings about the significance of inclusiveness diversity is acknowledging that there are differences and inclusivity is saying regardless of your differences you belong here and we acknowledge and work within those things so i think the individual's part in that is to take responsibility for how they are including the people around them and the knock-on effect and that's certainly what evidence is indicating is that organizations are getting better outputs from their people so it's in everybody's interests to feel like they belong um, and that i think links to another subject that are close to my heart which is this idea of micro behaviors um, that add to this feeling of inclusiveness so what's the individual's responsibility which is kind of your question and how does that help them taking responsibility for recognizing what sort of un unofficial club you're in in the workplace so are you in the in crowd or are you in the out not so in crowd so this idea of inclusion is also recognizing that our biases aren't just the classic uh, race or sex or um, abilities physical or otherwise it's also about whether or not you are more or less like me so you and I could be in a meeting with someone that is not as cool as us right and perhaps uh, they make a comment that doesn't go along with what we think or feel and we'll catch each other's eye and there'll be a little raise of an eyebrow maybe or a little roll of an eye or a sit back in the chair and those are these micro behaviors and so it can, can be described as microaggressions that indicate to that other person possibly not even consciously that they're not in with us uh, and by the same token that can then have a knock-on effect of feeling excluded and therefore a negative impact persons are slightly to offer ideas we could be missing out on some really good stuff just by inadvertently uh, reinforcing uh, the lack of inclusivity at a very subtle level and by the same token we're in the same meeting and you my lovely cool friend say something uh you know of note and of course I am vigorously nodding or mm -hmm, or yeah or supportive in some way so those micro behaviors can also be a positive thing micro affirming which also reinforces the very obvious difference to how I reacted to the per the other person's comments so recognising these inequalities in our reclusive behaviour, I think, are also really key. And do you think the size of a company um, affects, you know, kind of kind of identifying these micro expressions? So obviously, within a small business, it might be easier to handle it and to see it rather than in a big company. Yeah, well, I think it's uh, back to our point about it. It's everybody's job. Uh, you know, it doesn't, it shouldn't matter how large the organisation is. If our leaders are behind the idea of diversity and inclusion and inclusiveness, then uh, willingly uh, being open to, uh, to challenge about their own um, potential unconscious biases is really key. Uh, and also uh, calling other people out on it. So, you know, this isn't OK. This is not tolerated. I will I will ask the question. And overall, how would you explain the knock-on effect on covering and overcoming unconscious bias has within a company as a whole? Well, that's an interesting point, isn't it? And I think, um, you know, again, there are, there are much better people than I have done research on this already. Um, but the push towards it is we get the best out of people when they feel like they belong. You know, if I feel I can be my full self, my best self, 
can speak unguardedly about my opinions, my views, uh, my differing opinions and views and perspectives and feel that that is valued and heard, then an organisation is more richly engaging and, and hopefully um, improving because everybody's contributing. And that's, you know, a little bit of a dream maybe, but we'd like to get there. That's perfect. Well, thank you so much for talking with me, Jane, today. And I hope you have a good day. Thank you very much.